All right, great to see everyone coming through here. It's Mike Graham. I'm gonna just hold on a sec, let a couple more people come out of the waiting room. I was trying to be clever and cue up the Star Wars theme music to introduce today's talk and it's just not gonna happen. And I don't think anyone wants to hear me hum it. So we're gonna just take a second here, let Dan's followers show up on the, uh, on the participant list and then get started in one second. Everyone also realize that after um, or during the talk, if you follow up for any reason, you can always pick it up streaming um, as well through the website. Also wanna remind all of you that you are not, you're supposed to be muted throughout the seminar, right? It will be at the very end of the seminar when we ask questions that I will be able to, uh, to talk, ask you to unmute or read your questions for you. Um, please do not attempt to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk, right? This is all about Dan's presentation today. Um, and then there will be an opportunity at the very end to ask questions. Basically the way this is gonna roll is um, Dan's gonna give his talk and um, soon after we will um, open it up to questions. I can either read the questions for you or I can ask you to unmute so you can ask your own question for Dan. Um, and then, and by all means, you can use your, the raise your hand um, feature if you'd like me to, uh, to unmute you and, and allow you to ask those questions. Um, and then um, the MLML IT staff is gonna have my back during all this and make sure everyone um, is, is able to watch the talk if they want to, as well as ask questions if needed. When that's all done, we're gonna boot everyone out except for Dan and his committee and I, and we will have our committee meeting. Um, and then later on um, today, I think the beer pigs have some festivities um, planned for Dan. And uh, somewhere in the middle of that, I will open the entire um, sound up for everyone to give a hoot and a holler when we are all done. So with that, I think we've got a great crowd showing up for Dan, and I want to go ahead and start my introduction. Um, this is actually an exciting time for us. In fact, the entire Graham family is pretty excited. You know, Dan came to us at Mouse Landing Marine Labs in fall of 2015. Um, and I went back to his, his application, you know, like I try for a lot of them to kind of remind myself of his reasons for coming to Moss Landing Marine Labs. Um, and Dan's was a great one. I found a, a wonderful line at the end of his statement of purpose for his, his MLML application. And I'm just going to read it verbatim. As a mentor, I feel that Dr. Hamilton will expand upon my foundation of ocean systems by helping me develop a greater understanding of the interaction between fishes and benthic systems. That's right. Dan didn't even apply to my lab. I had to lure him over from the dark side. I think it took maybe aquaculture class when I was able to get him to understand that the beer pigs empire was where he actually needed to be. <laughs> and luckily for me, I have a very good working relationship with Scott Hamilton. <laughs> so I think it, would, it turned out great for everyone. He took my marine ecology class with Scott. Um, Way back when, he then TA'd that class, took biology of seaweeds, and then Dan was off and going. He took the Baja class, which he's actually submitting a paper uh, very soon for publication. He took the Chile class, and I know he had a blast. And then he took scientific methods, where for some reason he felt um, the confidence after that to basically argue with me from then on out on everything scientific, which is actually what we teach you in scientific methods. So I think he did a great job there. And he's really developed into a fantastic student and a mentor for other students. I know a lot of students last few years have gotten a lot of help out of Dan. Along the way, he acquired funding from Coast, from the California College of Arts, from San Jose State University, and the Simpkins Family Scholarship. He made lots of presentations to numerous WSN meetings um, and co-authored a poster at the Oysters about oysters um, at the San Francisco Estuary Conference where he is now a co-author on a subsequent pu uh, publication that came out this year um, with a variety of colleagues, including Luke Gardner, then biological conservation. So we're very excited that he's been able to make some important contributions before he even finished his master's. He worked on a ton of projects at Moss Lane Marine Labs, and I mean a ton, everything diving or not diving, it didn't matter. Dan was excited and interested in it, including oyster restoration, IMTA, seaweed, abalone, aquaculture, bull kelp aquaculture and restoration, and of course, seaweed farming, um, including being my right hand person at as a farm manager at Monterey Bay Seaweeds. And that position upon completion of this thesis turns into a full time science director. So we are very excited 
that Dan is not going anywhere. So I'm not going to get teary eyed about how he's going to be leaving us because, um, you know, we've got Dan for a while and we're very excited about that. So the Beer Pigs, Dan's committee, Scott and I, and I, and all of the little grams running around our house are really proud to present to you Dan and his thesis entitled Epiphyte Host Dynamics Between Pyropia Neurocystis in Central California. Take it away, Dan. Thanks, Mike. And thank you all for coming. Uh, but before defend, I would like to elaborate a little bit on uh, the beer pigs and that logo in the bottom left. Oops. Who are the beer pigs? Well, we are phycologists that study benthic ecology through experimental research and phycology in general. But that's not all we, who we are. We are explorers that are enamored by marine science. Yes, and sometimes even fish, but really only the cute tiny fish. We are builders and engineers that always strive to better ourselves through teamwork and lab meetings. And we aren't just scientists. Some of us are dancers. Some of us are artists. And some of us do other eccentric extracurricular activities too. We're all colleagues that go through this master's journey together and help each other. And I owe a lot to all my beer pig friends. Oh yeah, and some of us always really like to strike poses. This is my buddy Matt in the center there, who I make fun of a lot, but I love you, man. No matter where the tides, where the tides take us, there's, only, there's one man who really navigates us through these waters, Dr. Mike Graham. Oh, sorry, this is just a symptom of a Zoom lab meeting. Sometimes Zoom makes you look a little bit different than what you look like in reality. Here he is, Mike Graham. Contrary to popular belief, he does sleep. And Mike loves kelp. Somehow, despite me immediately shrugging off the concept of joining his lab when I applied to Moss Landing, his teaching convinced me that the psychology lab was the right place to be. Mike taught me three of the most important things I learned from Moss Landing. Pisco sours, seaweeds, and stats. One example you can see here, the causal relationship between the effect of being in Chile and Mike's pisco consumption rate. Yes, causal. No Pisco correlations with Mike. Some people don't recognize that plants and seaweeds really are two different types of organisms. Mike really drilled that concept in first thing. He's a brilliant guy, renowned for dozens of publications with thousands of citations, who's taught me a lot about how to prioritize. Mike's not just a scientist, he's an organizer and a family man, and his wife Erica and the rest of the family also play a pivotal role in the lab activities. Sometimes he can come off as intimidating or scary, such as in this picture where he's in, uh, imitating Santa Predator, but really he's a nice guy and always takes his students into consideration. We may stress him out a lot with all our shirt pulling during our time here at Moss, which may explain why not too long ago he looked like this with no gray hair, but Mike sticks, sticks with us to the very end and really from all of us, thanks Mike. Okay, here we go. To prime everyone with an outline of this defense, I'll first be introducing everyone with information necessary to understand how I conceptualize my questions. I'll briefly be overviewing these questions and associated hypotheses, and then I'll go over the field and lab methods as a whole before addressing the data analysis and results section for each question in turn. I'll finish my defense with a recap of my results and a discussion of what they mean relating to the Central Californian Pyropia and Neurocystis epiphyte host dynamics paradigm. Epiphyte host dynamics. Let's start with a little introduction to some terminology as a primer. The breakdown of the word epiphyte is a plant, phyte, that is upon something else or is on top of something, epi. Terrestrial epiphytes live at least one portion of their life cycle devoid of soil nutrients and deprive all their required, or, and derive all their required nutrition from the moisture in the air around them. Epiphytes are a common occurrence in many ecosystems around the world and comprise an interaction by the host plant or the basophyte, the bottom plant, providing space for the epiphyte to grow on. Epiphytes in the context of macro, macroalgae or the more primitive photoautotrophic organisms that inhabit coastal ecosystems are algae attached to other algae. The attached alga is the epiphyte and the host is the basophyte. Air isn't always a barrier for nutrient uptake because macroalgae live in a seawater medium typically filled with all the things an alga craves. 
and algae can uptake these nutrients through their whole body structure. Hosts facilitate epiphytes by providing a place to attach, but epiphytes can affect their hosts in different ways. Epiphytes can simply live on hosts without significantly affecting host species. Epiphytes can result in significantly greater drag forces, dislodging their hosts through an antagonistic interaction. And epiphytes can also serve as a protective mutualist that lives on a host and deters host competitors or consumers interested in the bite. Epiphytes can be either nonspecific or grow on any host substrate by chance, such as the epiphyte in the, in the top four pictures, Microcladia, or can be obligative or selectively be dependent on a specific host. In central California, if you walk the beaches in winter, you may see this epiphyte host interaction in the sand or on the rocks. The bull kelp Nereocystis lutkaana acts as a host for the obligate red algal epiphyte pyrochia. You probably haven't heard of this genus before, but nori, those seaweed paper snacks and the seaweed around sushi rolls, that's the genus pyrochia. Pyropia nereocystis, the bread, uh, the, the, <laughs> the brilliant red single cell thick algal epiphyte was actually the first species of the genus Pyropia in 1899, with the genus named after its fiery red color, thus pyro. Its primary substrate is the bull kelp, and thus its species was named after the genus of kelp that is its primary host. This epiphyte host relationship is obligative Again, obligative meaning pyropia is overwhelmingly epiphytizing host nereocystis. The rest of my introduction is going to be informing you of what we know about this relationship between these two species. To introduce you to some seaweed jargon, our host nereocystis is a kelp and is one of the most more complex macroalgae. The thallus is the general term referring to the whole body of an alga, thalli for plural. And the alga utilizes blades like leaves as primary light harvesters. The long stem-like part of the thallus is called the stipe, on top of which is an nematocyst or an air-filled bulb. The stipe has a hollow section connected to the nematocyst called the apophysis, of, of which we really don't know much about. And the non-hollow section below, below it is attached to the holdfast, which secures the kelp to the substrate and allows it to hold fast when subject to intense hydrodynamic forces. Unlike roots, it doesn't primarily function to collect nutrients. Now the epiphyte pyropia is an alga with a simpler thallus comprised of a tiny but incredibly strong filamentous holdfast and a singular blade, uh, both of them together com combined is the thallus. The entire blade, the entire thallus is one cell thick. And pyropia recruits primarily on the stipes of nereocystis as an epiphyte. Both of these macroalgae are annuals and can live opportunistically for up to two years if conditions are right. However, this characterization is only for the macroscopic stages of these two species, and dynamics get a bit more complex when phycologists took the microscopic stage into consideration. Both of these algae are actually heteromorphic diplohaplonic, two complex words I'll elaborate on. Heteromorphic meaning that different life stages have different forms, hetero different, morphic forms. And for algae, two sets of chromosomes are characterized as the sporophyte diploid stage, while one set of chromosomes is characterized as the gametophyte haploid stage, diplohaplonic. Notice how the ploidy is switched for the epiphyte and the host regarding size. For nereocystis, host, for nereocystis hosts, the sporophyte is the macroscopic stage, whereas for the epiphyte pyropia, the gametophyte is the microscopic stage. The life cycle for all kelps adheres to this biphasic pattern, where a macroscopic sporophyte stage matures and releases zoospores that swim away from the light and recruit on the seafloor as either female or male gametophytes. The female creates and releases an egg that attracts male spermatia that fertilize the egg, at which point the resulting zygote and subsequent germling is a sporophyte at the microscopic stage. The germling, if it survives, grows up into a canopy kelp at the surface of the water, and the process repeats. The life cycle of pyropia is somewhat flipped. The sporophyte for pyropia is the microscopic stage, and this stage is called the conchocelis. The conchocelis is named after what it lives in, shells, conch shells. It recently has been demonstrated to actively burrow into shells, 
and it can live there for multiple years. But really, Coccoceal's ecology and distribution in the wild is poorly understood. Given certain conditions induced by day length and temperature, the thin vegetative Coccoceal cells bulk up into Conchosporangia, where they produce Conchospores, which are released after a temperature decrease. Conchospores germinate into gametophyte germlings that eventually grow into larger blades, which are monoecious or contain both male and female reproductive parts. Male parts from one individual fertilizes the female parts from another individual, which then go through more cellular divisions before releasing zygotospores that recruit as conchocelis. And the cycle repeats. We see this epiphyte host interactions in natural systems during which the annual stages of both species are present. The microscopic stage is difficult to test hypotheses on in natural experiments due to its small size and due to the abundance of sympatric microalgae and microbiota interfering in observations and measurements. However, we do know that the macroscopic stage of both epiphyte and host persists throughout the host's range across heterogeneous latitudinal environmental conditions. Investigations of this relationship in wave swept areas are tricky to say the least given the nature of the exposed coastline. This may be why there has been a lack of natural experiments examining the epiphyte host relationship. But despite these harsh conditions along host neurocystis's range, pyropia comes back as an epiphyte every year and sometimes quite abundantly on some or many neurocystis hosts. Although neurocystis populations have been routinely observed to have pyropia epiphytes, these populations can show lots of variability in epiphytism. I've observed some neurocystis within these populations unepiphytized by pyropia at multiple times of the year, up until some of the last neurocystis remained in a cohort. For neurocystis that were epiphytized throughout the year, I observed a range of sizes of epiphytes within the same site at the same time and different vertical distributional patterns and host types as seen in these three pictures above. This vertical distribution, however, primarily has pyropia biomass located closer to the nematocyst in the upper water column with decreasing pyropia abundance with depth as seen on the two right images displayed. Furthermore, the number of epiphytized pyropia can vary among neurocystis hosts. Size differences among epiphyte pyropia in these species' geographic distribution range from a few centimeters, such as the one barely being able to be seen above my right thumb, to very large, as seen on the 10-page pressing on the right. Their sizes can range up to two orders of magnitude among individuals, and thousands of individuals can epiphytize a single neurocystis, or a single individual can. So most of the previous work on this epiphyte host relationship has been done in the lab. This diagram was constructed from a lab study in Washington, which placed laboratory cultures of conchocelis in a matrix of different temperatures and day lengths in an attempt to determine the conditions necessary to make pyropia's microscopic stage go reproductive. Dixon and Walland, the authors, discovered that conchospore release for this pyropia species occurs after the conchocelis' induction by environmental characteristics. It was speculated that this was the mechanism that allowed conchospores to hit that perfect timing which neurocystis hosts were present in the canopy with enough time to recruit, grow, and undergo gametogenesis before the host neurocystis was dislodged and swept away by the swell. Pardon the jargon, I slip, I slip it in there sometimes. Um, so Dixon and Wallen created this diagram to fit these speculations. The seasonal day length on top and the seasonal temperature on the bottom line up to match up with the recruitment period of neurocystis in spring and the persistence of neurocystis until winter, where the life cycle completes. The cleanliness and synchronicity of this diagram make it a concise story, but there are a few holes. First, the photo period of this generalization is only for one particular location along neurocystis's range, whereas at different locations in this range, there are differences in maximum day length, minimum day length, and the day length's rate of change through time. Second, temperature shifts described here in this generalized model also shift as a function of latitude. Furthermore, interannual temperature anomalies in smaller scale regional bathymetric and climactic patterns vary along the Pacific Northeast coastline, affecting sea surface temperature along Neurocystis's range. 
in addition to there being plenty of other abiotic and biotic differences along this range. As temperature plays a role in the life cycle of both epiphyte and host, heterogeneity in oceanographic conditions may play a role in distributional and demographic patterns on a smaller scale. Third, there is little known about the individual relationship of pyropia and nereocystis, the interaction that may characterize variability within pyropia populations. Lastly, general, this generalization was created from a lab study looking at the conchospore release of pyropia conchocelis, and it hasn't been reconciled with natural replicated studies examining epiphyte host dynamics in the field. For this thesis, I tested hypotheses relating to pyropian nereocystis dynamics in Central California related to, relating to three general questions. I asked, does pyropia presence in Central California vary on a population scale? For this question, I hypothesized that when the epiphyte was present, epiphytism presence on hosts among sites in the region would shift over time rather than be statically high or low. This presence is going to be defined in the study as a density of nereocystis with and without hyperopia as an epiphyte. Additionally, I hypothesize that the regularity of pyropia presence would be more variable for epiphytized hosts compared with non-epiphytized hosts when both were present. Non-epiphytized hosts would be more regularly dispersed than epiphytized hosts. I'll detail the response variable coefficient of variation later. For my second question, I asked, how do pyropia and nereocystis populations respond to spatial differences? I hypothesized that transplants of both life stages of pyropia would consequentially suffer deleterious growth effects when moved deeper down in the water column. In this hypothesis, the spatial difference would be depth, and I'll be transplanting and testing the gametophyte blade and microscopic conchoceles separately. I also hypothesized that host nereocystis morphology would significantly differ among host populations at the time of pyropia recruitment due to small scale intra-regional environmental heterogeneity among sites. And lastly, I hypothesized that spatial differences would result in differences in the presence of gametogenic blades among sites and between the final two sampling periods. For my third and final question, I ask, do pyropia nereocystis epiphyte host interactions vary on an individual scale? I hypothesize that either how deep the, the nereocystis was attached or nereocystis site morphology would correlate with pyropia's lower recruitment depth limit and nereocystis's site morphology would correlate with pyropia's total attached biomass. Again, I looked at three different aspects of, this, of these epiphyte host dynamics, whether the presence of pyropia nereocystis would vary over time on a population scale, whether epiphyte and host respond to spatial differences, and whether the interaction between epiphyte and host varied on an individual scale. As a reminder, I'm going to go through all field and lab methods for my study all at once. I selected five sites at the southern end of Nereocystis' range, see the, see the orange stars on the left, without any a priori knowledge of environmental oceanographic conditions with the condition that Nereocystis populations were present within each site. I sampled in a bed at least 70 meters by 100 meters large. If the bed at that site was larger, I'd isolate a specific region to return to over time. Over nine sampling periods, separ separated by one and a half to two months, from November 2017 to February 2019, I sampled nereocystis populations within each site. Within each sampling period, I sampled all sites with a maximum of one to, one to two weeks apart among all sites. Within these sites, I conducted canopy surveys consisting of five one meter by 30 meter transects. These transects were conducted by securing a transect tape to a nereocystis stipe at approximately three to four meters depth using a rubber gear tie. These transects were separated by approximately 10 meters and were oriented in parallel with one another. If a nereocystis fell within a meter on the left of the transect, the diver on my team would identify whether or not pyropia was, was present on that nereocystis and count it. Due to the patchy nature of these stipes, there was often a lot of variability in stipe counts, both within a sampling period and across sampling periods. The total numbers of nereocystis with and without pyropia present 
were recorded for each transect at each sampling period and at each site. At the same sites, and after an initial few sampling periods used to assess feasibility in collection maintenance and processing, I haphazardly collected four individuals of Neriocystis per sampling period per site with the condition that these Neriocystis be epiphytized with pyropia when pyropia was present. To maximize efficiency of collections with minimal confusion, I used highly specialized scientific containers, which hopefully don't reflect the quality of my work and specialized scientific collection bags for isolation. Although to decide, these collections could be quite large with some near assistance individuals being in excess of 90 pounds and 25 meters long, about 80 feet. And the whole study having collected over two and a half tons of near assistance biomass. Collection begun with divers severing the near assistance at the hold fast with diving scissors while collecting the individual's hold fast depth. Divers would then proceed to safely ascend at a rate of one foot every two seconds while coiling the non-hollow portion of the stipe and securing it with a rubber gear tie, all while not trying to get attacked by blue rockfish. And upon reaching the surface, buddy teams would work together, measuring the maximum blade length before either towing the individuals to shore for shore dives or to the boat to be placed in their specialized collection bag. Every individual was associated with a color or a label for processing back at the lab or on shore. If pyropia were present, a subsample of pyropia was removed from the stipe and was photographed to determine the presence or absence of pneumatogenesis. Afterwards, all pyropia on that individual, including the subsample, were consolidated and then placed in pre-weighed foil packages, which were later dried to collect pyropia dry weight. Among the many morphometrics collected from all neurocystis individuals included number and length of blades, biomass of blades, stipe, an entire thallus, and lengths and diameters of sections along the stipe. All of these morphometrics needed to be processed within three days of sampling, as a few initial sample, samples processed after three days begun decaying and needed to be excluded from the data set. Point being, I took a number of measurements in order to look at the nuanced differences in Neriocystis form over space and time. For pyropia gametophyte and conchocelous transplants, three standardized punches of pyropia were taken from the intersection of three individual replicate pyropia blades, a total of nine punches. Each punch from a single blade was randomly assigned to one of three depths in the water column, and the process was repeated for the other two blades. The depth treatments were designed to be at or below the observed lower limit in central California at six meters. Each punch was maintained in the best cages the dollar store had to offer, a perforated Tupperware secured with cable ties to prevent the confounding effects of grazers. Within each cage, pyropia were secured using a plastic clip and the experiment was left in the field for a total of 21 days. After the study period, each punch was removed and photographed for sizing photo analysis. Now remember pyropia being defined by its fiery red color? The same red pigments exist within the amplified's conchocelous stage and actually make them fairly easy to identify using microscopy. Using exposure of blue and ultraviolet light, the conchocelous can be identified even in the presence of other microscopic organisms by the intensity and emission color of its fluorescence. My conchocelous transplants utilize a tool from one of my earlier pilot studies, an observational intertidal nodule for conchocelous endolithic recruitment, or an oinker for short. I settled, I, I settled zygotospores from the epiphyte pyropia's blades on these oinkers and placed them on a customized 3D printed slide used to standardize tile starting location and used a stratified random sampling method to locate three individual conchocelous that recruited by utilizing epifluorescent microscopy. After marking and reconfirming the reliability of using a metered microscope microscope stage to identify individuals, tiles were bolted to a PVC fixture that was cable tied to a mooring setup at one meter intervals with a sample size of 15 depths between five and 21 meters. An additional blank tile was used as an indicator to control for any potential artifacts associated with field recruitment of conchocelous. I'll now proceed to review each question, uh, for each question, how I analyze my data 
and what the results were, starting with question one. As a recap, I asked, does pyropia presence in Central California vary on a population scale? I tested differences among two response variables over time, nearest assist densities with and without pyropia present, and the coefficient of variation for these densities. The density of individuals per site was calculated by taking the count divided by the area sampled for each count and treating each transect as a subsample to characterize density with and without pyropia per site and n equals n of five sites. The regional density was calculated by taking the mean and standard error of those five sites. The coefficient of variation, a metric to compare variability among populations with different distributions by standardizing the variability to the mean was calculated for each site at each sampling period to obtain the mean and standard error coefficient of variation for near assistance densities with and without pyropia present. In this case, the coefficient of variation uh, replicate was, each, was using each transect within, this, within each site. Both the density and the coefficient of variation for near assistus with and without pyropia present were compared among the sampling periods when pyropia was present in the region using, using separate two-way ANOVAs after visually inspecting for independently and identically distributed residuals. In my results, <clears throat> Pyropia presence results are displayed here across sampling periods on the x-axis with responses, the first one being density on the y-axis of, of epiphytized hosts in black bars and non-epiphytized hosts in gray bars. I started my study in November, 2017 after pyropia already recruited at all my sites. The mean density of neurocystis, again, the response on the y-axis for for this cohort decreased over time until August 2018 when the cohort was fully removed. Again, this was determined by the presence of epiphytes, not necessarily pyropia, on the neurocystis along the transects because <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Importantly, pyropia presence lasted for as long as neurocystis cohort persisted, but not all neurocystis had pyropia on them. The initial 2018-2019 neurocystis recruited the canopy in June in the June 28 in the June 2018 sampling period. This marked the first availability of substrate for the upcoming pyropia cohort. Pyropia, however, did not recruit until two to three sampling periods later in the September and November 2018 sampling periods. A noticeable increase in epiphytism occurred between the September and, no and November sampling periods, and unexpectedly, the early 2019 swells removed neurocystis from all sites by the February 2019 sampling period. The 2017-2018 neurocystis overlapped cohorts with the neurocystis for the following year, but the following year's cohorts cohort was wiped entirely clear in the region by February 2019. The regional error bars across sampling periods were fairly large, suggesting mean differences among sites. When that variability was standardized to mean density, variability in epiphytized and non-epiphytized host densities among sites within the region was compared using the coefficient of variation, the response on the y-axis, with higher numbers meaning larger variability, standardized to mean, and lower numbers being lower variability or more regularity. As you can see, epiphytized neurocystis densities in black had a routinely lower coefficient of variation within the region compared to non-epiphytized neurocystis densities in gray, suggesting that epiphytism presence was routinely more regular than epiphytism absence when pyropia was present. For my second question, remember, I was utilizing transplants of pyropia gametophytes in Concacillus among site comparisons of host morphometrics and pyropia gametogenesis presence to test for spatial differences. Images of each transplant replicate for each treatment were photo analyzed using ImageJ and the change in area for both pyropia gametophyte blades and coccoceal surface area on tile subsamples were used as responses for st statistical analyses. Differences in pyropia gametophyte blade change in area was compared among depth treatments using a one-way fixed factor ANOVA. A significant correlative relationship between coccoceal's change in area versus depth was tested using a Pearson's correlation analysis. 
and differences among sites for five near assistance morphometrics were tested using one, a one, one way random factor ANOVAs, site being the random factor. And presence of gametogenesis in subsamples of hyropia blades was tested using two methods pooling the last two sampling periods among sites and pooling all sites to test for a difference between the last two sampling periods. Significant differences among sites in between times were separately analyzed using two chi-square tests of heterogeneity. Over a period of 21 days, transplanted gametophytes increased by up to five-fold. And over a period of 31 days, Conchocelis increased by up to tenfold. You can see the before and after picture on the oinker there. Gametophytes among three depths in the water column showed no significant differences among treatments, with the shallowest treatment actually having the lowest mean change in area. Again, there were more samples across the depth range for Conchocelis, so depth was treated as a continuous variable and each tile's three conchocele subsamples were averaged to get a single replicate per depth. Conchocele's change in area significantly increased with depth with larger growth rates occurring deeper after 12 meters. After 12 meters. Remember, this is just the surface area expression. Neriocystis host morphometrics were more prevalently differed within the region in November when compared to September. Remember the first pyropia recruit was observed in both of, those, both of those times. Importantly though, spatial differences within the region were significant for both sampling periods. The presence of pyropia gametogenesis in subsamples taken from collected near assistus hosts, host types differed among sites for all pooled sampling periods and regionally when all sites were pooled between the November and January sampling periods with a greater occurrence in January. And for my third and last question of this study, I, hypoth I hypothesized that epiphyte host dynamics would vary on an individual scale, particularly for the lower pyropia recruitment limit and for pyropia biomass. Some of the aforementioned site morphometrics I was comparing earlier among sites were used to model nereal cystis type surface area by stacking an ellipsoid, the nematocyst, on top of two truncated cones, the apophysis, on top of a cylinder the non-hollow portion of the stipe. In addition to estimating surface area using these morphometrics, five morphometrics were used as inputs in a principal component analysis for the responses of pyropia lowest recruitment depth and measurable pyropia biomass separately, two principal component analyses. Each collected neurocystis that had associated with both the five morphometrics and a response was included in those principal component analyses. For the pyropia biomass response, only the last sampling period for the 2018-2019 cohort was included due to negligible epiphyte biomass occurring prior to that period. A principal component analysis takes the variability from a number of attributes and rearranges that variability into principal components, each of which having different attribute contributions per component and different percent total variability explained per component. For example, and to save some time, Having tested correlations between principal components and the separate response variables after adjusting my alpha due to multiple comparisons, a significant relationship occurred between what was primarily characterized as variability associated with the hollow section lengths for individuals and pyropia's lower recruitment depth limit, and a significant relationship occurred between what was characterized as variability with longer and more cylindrical stipes, primarily larger stipes that were more cylindrical, and pyropia biomass. Tests for a correlative relationship between the lower pyropia recruitment depth limit on individual neurocystis and both seafloor depth or neurocystis holdfast depth and the principal component related to hollowing were conducted using a Pearson's correlation analysis, separate Pearson's correlation analyses. And tests for a cor correlative relationship between pyropia biomass on individual neurocystis and an individual's host surface area and the principal component associated with longer and more cylindrical hosts were conducted, were also conducted using Pearson's correlation analyses. A fourth loop transformation was made for pyropia biomass response 
uh, to fit the assumptions of independent and identically distributed residuals from the model. And now for my results. The pyropia measurement for my results will be located on the y-axis as a continuous variable, and the nearest cystis variables will be located on the x-axis, also as continuous variables. There was no observed relationship between nearest cystis whole fast step on the x-axis again, and the lowest rec pyropia recruitment on the y-axis on that nearest cystis. Therefore, the lower pyropia recruitment depth limit was not set by host recruitment depth. There were a few individuals that did, however, recruit closer to the seafloor, with the lowest recruit spotted down at 12 meters depth. The principal component response on the x-axis for this figure is a unitless characterization of morphological variability and can essentially be described as shorter to longer hollow sections for the hosts. There was a significant moderate positive correlation between lowest recruitment depth on near assistance and the neurocystis principal component primarily associated with longer hollow sections. Pyropia biomass after being fourth root, port, fourth root transformed to meet the assumptions of independence and identically distributed residuals on the, on the y-axis was significantly positively moderately correlated with host surface area. And the strongest correlation between a pyropia response was a significant positive, but still moderate correlation between the fourth root transform pyropia biomass and the first principal component of neurocystis morphometrics representing longer and more cylindrical types. Prim again, this principal component was primarily larger and more cylindrical hosts. Now to recap, for my first question regarding pyropia presence in central California, I tested differences in epiphytized versus non-epiphytized densities and differences in the coefficient of variance, variation of these densities over time. Within the region, differences in epiphyte presence were significant, but the interaction between presence and time was also significant, signifying a shift in epiphytized ratio over, uh, across time. The coefficient of variation for epiphytized versus non-epiphytized densities over time also exhibited significant differences, but pyropia presence was actually more regular than pyropia absence, which was the opposite of what I expected. My second question regarded whether the effects of spatial environmental heterogeneity or biotic heterogeneity influence epiphyte host dynamics. I hypothesized that pyropia gametophytes, which primarily reside on upper neurocystis types toward the canopy, would exhibit a deleterious growth response when transplanted deeper in the water column. This hypothesis was not supported as pyropia transplants did not significantly differ among depths when, tr when transplanted below the lower limit observed in, in the field and actually had a greater mean growth response at deeper, deeper depths. Conca seals transplants additionally showed a positive correlative surface area growth response with respect to depth, again rejecting my hypothesis that growth response will be deleterious at deeper depths. Neurocystis morphometrics among site comparisons, or neurocystis morphometrics among sites, mostly differed at the periods of initial pyropia recruitment, suggesting that hosts responded to environmental or biotic heterogeneity with morphological or developmental differences, and thus pyropia was exposed to and recruited in the presence of these differences. These results supported my hypotheses. Pyropia among sites and between the final two sampling periods exhibited significantly different frequencies of gametogenesis on blades, suggesting that spatial differences and the time elapsed also affected pyropia reproduction. And for my last question, I asked whether the individual pyropia and neurocystis relationship would differ depending on number of host morphometrics. Specifically, I asked whether pyropia recruitment depth limit and epiphytized pyropia biomass correlated with these neurocystis metrics. I found no relationship between pyropia recruitment depth limit and how deep the neurocystis holdfast was, and thus how deep the seafloor was. However, neurocystis morphometrics associated with longer neurocystis apophyses, that hollow region, were correlated with a deeper pyropia recruitment depth limit. Additionally, pyropia biomass attached to individual neurocystis types correlated with both the surface area and the principal component related to the increased neurocystis length and cylindricity, or primarily larger neurocystis. 
The principal component's relationship with biomass was the strongest, but was still only a moderate correlation. While the bulk of my hypotheses were supported, a number of hypotheses were not, and I'll attempt to discuss these results and what we now know of the pyropia and neurocystis epiphyte, epiphyte host paradigm in Central California. Now, let's take a more generalized look at Dixon and Wallen's clean diagram and make it a little bit messier. I'll highlight the changes in color. First, we can still generalize seasonal differences, but let's remove photoperiod and temperature as both of those really are specific to just Washington. There is at least one sampling period's worth of time between, neurocystis hits, between when neurocystis hits the canopy and when pyropia epiphytizes neurocystis. I'll add in an unepiphytized neurocystis in the middle here. Other studies in other regions have confirmed that neurocystis primarily is unepiphytized when it hits the canopy. Is that when the conchospores attach to host neurocystis or do conchospores attach earlier? Two of my pilot anecdotal observations from canopy site scrapings separated by a period of one month observed red algal spores on neurocystis sites in the canopy for the second scraping, but not the first. So it happens sometime between then. Both maintenance of these spores and identification of these spores failed. Really, this isn't a question of, for microscopy. This question may be answered, however, with DNA testing of water samples and identification of pyropia in those samples if the ploidy, remember conchospores will be haploid, could be determined. As of now, the aspect of this paradigm remains a mystery. Neurocystis is not necessarily epiphytized by pyropia when pyropia is present. So I'll add in a number of unepiphytized neurocystis. Remember, this is just pyropia epiphytism. These neurocystis will, pro will probably be epiphytized by other species. Neurocystis can persist for longer than one year and so can pyropia. And as I observed among multiple sites, pyropia abundance can be variable. Much like field work and really life in general, random elements play an important role in spatiotemporal epiphyte host dynamics. Pyropia neurocystis dynamics are not clean. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. This epiphyte host interaction is an obligative relationship between pyropia and neurocystis. Why does pyropia need neurocystis? Ultimately, we just don't know. Ecologists, chemists, and biologists still seek to understand how and why different obligative epiphyte host relationships are formed. Some causalities behind these relationships include the epiphyte's ability to manipulate the cell walls of some, some hosts, the epiphyte spores being able to utilize specialized microrigosities of host morphological features, the epiphyte being able to utilize biochemical components provided by hosts, or the epiphyte being able to bypass antibiotic components created by hosts. This is just a small sample of, of what we know. The creators of the figure I manipulated earlier suggested that a connective mucus released with pyropia conchospores spores may, be, may allow the spores to swing around the neurocystis types through what they call the bola effect. Conchospores spores could just as easily be facilitated by microbiota on the microscopic level on host neurocystis types. Biofilm can be comprised of a plethora of microalgae, microbiota, and bacteria that can deter or facilitate this microscopic, on this microscopic scale. Biofilms can be comprised of, of a diverse and complex microscopic communities. Roland in 1980 examined succession on neurocystis types at a site in British Columbia, and indeed observed pioneer species on stipes being comprised of multiple microscopic species before any pyropia epiphyte settled. The microbiome may play an important role in stipe succession dynamics relating to, epiphyte, to the epiphyte pyropia, or it may not. This remains outside the scope of this study. The story of neurocystis and pyropia is a story of persistence and it's a story of opportunism. Both epiphyte and host have opportunistically evolved to inhabit the roughest waters in the Northeast Pacific. Pyropia presence in terms of epiphytized densities and regularity of these densities tell us two things. First, the interaction between epiphyte presence over time was driven by the shift in the ratio of epiphytized to non-epiphytized neurocystis as pyropia recruited and neurocystis was removed from the kelp beds due to the swell. 
The population of neurocystis decreases throughout the year with unknown ramifications for epiphyton host population dynamics relating to localized and far spread spore dispersal. Second, the consistent regularity of epiphytism among sites compared to non epiphytized neurocystis suggests that the persistence capabilities of the epiphyte pyropia may be greater than that of host neurocystis populations. Entanglement of neurocystis and ramping of conchospore release through fall and, in, and into winter may play a role in this, as anecdotally, entangled neurocystis both increased variability in transit counts and thus the coefficient of variation, while also didn't persist as long as the individual neurocystis. The continued increase of the coefficient of variation later on for unepiphytized neurocystis was due to more prevalence in epiphytism towards the end of the cohort. Quite interestingly, the example in this picture was historically a giant kelp bed inside the Monterey Bay. So this is, nearest, this is a neurocystis bed inside the Monterey Bay. And only just last year had substantial neurocystis recruitment. In two, and I don't expect it to even persist here. In two, two areas such as this that I observed, one closer to the most Southern site, both beds were heavily epiphytized by pyropia right on cue. This is one of two similar observations that make me speculate that the distribution of the epiphyte pyropius conchoceles extends beyond the range of historic neurocystis beds and that the perenniating nature of the conchoceles and the drifting transport on dislodged neurocystis allows for this large distribution. In central California, neurocystis recruits before pyropia. We are still unsure whether or not this is due to biological anti-epiphytism properties of neurocystis or whether conchospore release is seasonally timed to be later on after neurocystis canopy recruitment. It could also be both. Some phycologists in the seaweed farming industry have observed that conchospores of other pyropia species are or can be positively buoyant. This may explain the vertical distribution of the epiphyte residing primarily in the upper portions of the stipes. But for individuals with deeper pyropia depth limits, does that mean that the conchospores were released right at the hold fast of neurocystis? Furthermore, is there a depth at which conchospore genesis requires a certain amount of light? And how could this be modified by the biological community that includes pyropia? I do have a strong speculation that these snails play a role in the epiphyte host relationship in multiple ways. For starters, I've taken a tegula snail from a seafloor beneath a consistent neurocystis bed and examined it under the epi epifluorescent scope just as I did my tiles and, and saw conchoceles within the shell. Other shell samples didn't have conchoceles and I would need to ground truth uh, for confirmation with DNA testing, but we do know that the conchoceles of, bull kelp epiphyte pyro of the bull kelp epiphyte pyropia can persist subtidally in nature and living in mobile grazers may have its benefits. I speculate that snails and other radula bearing organisms may facilitate the conchoceles growth in another interesting way. As snails eat, they scour whatever substrate they're grazing on using a modified tongue-like structure called a radula. Oh, it's in the middle there. Uh, and in the process, these grazers cause biological corrosion of the substrate, removing an outer layer and potentially making conchoceles ripe for either further conchoceles growth or an increase in light necessary to induce conchospore genesis on the top layer. This is a testable hypothesis. The bioerosion hypothesis may play a role in the conchoceles growth rate with respect to depth, as conchoceles likely burrow differently with respect to depth due to depth differences, um, depth effects on light availability. But really to understand where the conchoceles is in the wild and to what extent it inhabits the enormous amount of calcium carbonate substrate available, we would need to further sample coupled with genetic testing for ground truthing, especially the species. Are the individual relationships observed between epiphytism of pyropia on neurocystis a function of differences among neurocystis uh, morphologies? Or are the differences for epiphyte responses and host morphology all just a symptom of spatial differences? Studies in mesocosms would be perfect for teasing out whether or not there are epiphyte uh, there are epiphyte pyropia responses due to host morphology and controlled conditions, but these are uh, sort of unfeasible because of the size of these neurocystis. This being said, 
There was an interspersion in most sites regarding morphological differentiation, but unfortunately, the level of replication was not sufficient to conduct an analysis of covariance to test for whether the relationship differed among sites or whether the differences were just among site differences. The interspersion, however, suggests that neurocystis influencing pyropia was likely the reason for at least some of the variability in the individual epiphyte host relationship observed in my findings. The relationship between pyropia biomass and larger neurocystis morphological princ principle component was the strongest, and it is possible that the principal component may have explained individual substrate availability better than the estimated surface area. Please ask me more about the individual dynamics following his defense because I've sort of run out of time or read my thesis. For future studies, outplanning neurocystis at different times could yield answers regarding whether or not there's a causal relationship between ages of hosts and the quantity, timing, and general presence of the epiphyte. An experiment causing a press disturbance that was initiated at different times at a site may yield answers on when the timing of conchospore settlement on neurocystis hosts occurs. And additionally, using lab-induced conchospore release and, and exposing those conchospores to sites at different times may yield insight on anti-epiphytism properties of hosts or pyropia's competitive relationships with other epiphytes or conspecifics. A study identifying microbial communities associated with sites and testing for a relationship with pyropia epiphytized may yield insight on whether or not there's a causal relationship there. And for pyropia conchospores, Sampling regional calcium carbonate substrate in the field may provide a better understanding of microscopic biogeography. And tagging dislodged neurocystis over multiple years in combination with running genetic analyses to look at the effect of rafting on epiphyte host genetic differentiation could be used to test for perineation differences and whether there is greater genetic diversity for hosts versus epiphytes or vice versa. And I'd be happy to elaborate on the potential of integrated multitrophic aquaculture with shellfish as long as the information is not proprietary. In conclusion, the epiphyte pyropia's persistence macroscopically depends on neurocystis's persistence or neurocystis's presence, but pyropia was a recurring epiphyte in all of my sites over two cohorts, despite the variability in the time of neurocystis's persistence. Environmental and or biological differences likely played a role in these epiphyte host dynamics and neurocystis may also moderately influence pyropia on an individual scale as a host by either inherent host differences or through host developmental differences as a function of spatial heterogeneity or simply just by spatial heterogeneity itself. And with that, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, thanks everyone. That's it, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the Bear Pigs, including Erica, have been my friends and colleagues and have definitely made graduate school manageable with help, advice, and friendship. And all the divers, most of which had to put up with me constantly sending emails, begging for help. Thank you so much. Here's a list of all the fieldwork help, including the divers, that really made this whole process feasible. From the divers that spent multiple 10-hour days every other month to the divers that helped only during the pilot experiment processes to the surface support that helped during the initial pilot morphological assessment, to Ross and Kevin who randomly showed up on the beach as I attempted to beach the inflatable in some rough swell and helped tow it in. And to everyone who helped by putting a hand on the nearest sisters collections for hauling. I'd like to thank all faculty and staff at Moss Landing Marine Labs, starting first and foremost with everyone at Marine Ops. Brian, JD, Jackson, Jenny, Evan, every single person at Marine Ops played a huge role in the sampling process, whether it was bringing the inflatable along with the Martin or launching at all sites on a long day, or whether it was helping with any of the logistics or conceptual feasibility of my thesis, or whether it was looking out for everyone's safety by calling some trips short the morning of or even mid-trip. Couldn't have done it without you, and I really appreciate it. There's too, there's, there's too many people to thank. Um, the shop guys really, they're, I mean, they're responsible for keeping moss landing running smoothly, whether it be making sure we have water, whether the entire moss landing island has water, or to put up, put, you know, being responsible for some pivotal development that really kept me employed at the aquaculture center. And for, for Chris for putting up with all my, my, uh, my random innovations and, and questions about, you know, mechanics and all that. 
they, so they amended everyone at the front desk, IT library staff, and the you guys are the cogs that keep Moss Landing Machine uh, working. And thanks for putting up with all my requests, making sure that I got paid, and putting up with my failures, submit calendar requests, and online tickets. Really, thanks, thanks to everyone at Moss Landing. And the, the trifecta who have by far been the best teachers in marine science I've, I've ever had, they really were responsible for my development as a scientist from writing to experimental design, to conceptualization, to inference. Take every class they have to offer or you're missing out. Special thanks to John, Camille and Abano for bringing me in and accepting me at Moss Landing. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you three. And you are all pivotal in my development as a scientist as well. Special thanks to the federal and state lands and their stewards that made this work possible. Bryn, Mark, Stephen Bachman, Matthew Allen. Shout out to Luke who's really tall. Kirsten who made my first publication possible with all the oyster work. Christina and Chris at the University of Rhode Island for the genetic identification, putting up with all my badgering. Peter and Andrew and the Monterey Abalone Company for the advice and friendship. And to all my interns and volunteers, Josiah and the Coast Crew, Really, Josiah was the reason that, all, that for the, the third question of my thesis, all the individual epiphyte host logistics, and it wouldn't have been possible without him. He volunteered so much of, help, of his time to help, and I appreciate you, man. Thank you for all the opportunities Moss Landing provided, from the funding to the work offered uh, at my, to my, uh, my current employment at Monterey Bay Seaweeds. Visit MontereyBaySeaweeds.com for more details, or to put in an order. <laughs> Uh, and thanks to my family for all their love and support. I miss you all. And hopefully earlier next year, I'll get to see you again and give you all hugs. And lastly, thanks to my life partner in love, Rachel, who's been with me. All right, Dan. Uh... For the entire journey and whose emotional support also made this possible. Thank you. That's it. Dan, Oops. you're awesome, buddy. And I'm done. Did. Thanks. Fantastic job. And now we want to open it up for questions. So please remind everyone that go ahead and raise your hand in the participants. If you want to ask Dan a question right now, I'll help read them off or we will alert you to being unmuted so that you can ask your questions directly. I definitely have a question for Dan. So right. I'm going to... Oh. Diana Steller, one of his committee members, she's going to ask the first question. So Diana, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and have a go at it. Hi, Dan. Great job. Hi, Diana. Um, I am interested in, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. Okay. I'm interested in the negative effects of the epiphyte on this species of kelp that lives in exposed environments. And you found a re some relationships with the morphology of Nereocystis, like the Halloween and the, all those names I couldn't remember, apophyses and, uh, <laughs> of the Nereo. And since more hollow individuals would be more buoyant, therefore in an exposed environment, a more buoyant species would be moving around in the water column more. What um, can you say about the, how could this increased movement potentially influence the epiphytism uh, by pyropia? Great question. Um, so there's a couple of things there to recap. Um, negative effects um, and how uh, the potential movement associated with um, the host movement could affect growth and or even recruitment. So um, near assistus, it grows that way and it's evolved um, a sort of allometric growth pattern where it, it, it sort of prioritizes getting up to the surface quickly and then it shifts its growth pattern into a form that allows it to, um, to persist in the swells. Um, it, this was uh, uh, Denny et al, 1997. Um, and so negative effects, uh, of pyropia on Neurocystis. So we saw pyropia ex uh, lasting until the end of uh, Neurocystis' persistence, um, both uh, present individuals and uh, not 
uh, both near sisters that did and did not have pyrovia present. Um, so uh, it, it's if pyrovia would uh, you know remove individuals that if, it, if there was a negative effect, uh, I'm guessing there would be more regularity um, in that coefficient of variation towards the end of um, nearest uh, end of the sample of the cohort. So we didn't see that though. There was more regularity in pyropia. So pyropia persists. Um, that, that would make me speculate that pyropia actually doesn't have that much of a negative effect. That including the fact that pyropia is such a small, um, despite being, you know, uh, having some pretty large biomasses, we're talking up to 75 grams of dry weight, which we're, multiply by 10. So 750 grams, almost a kilogram of wet weight of um, uh, uh, 2.2 pounds of wet weight of um, pyropia on neurocystis. I don't think that that would substantially affect um, the persistence that much. Um, the second part of the question was how does the movement of neurocystis affect uh, the pyropia growth? Um, consider, uh, considering that there is a substantial um, wave energy um, in, in the system. I, I wouldn't believe that uh, the, there would be much of a facilitation effect of, uh, the, of that extra movement associated with host moving on pyropia uh, because the boundary lo uh, layer for nutrient absorption is already pretty low due to high energy motion. But if there were, that would be, that would be why. You'd, be, you'd get an increased, um, Break down to that boundary layer, uh, better nutrient absorption. Um, some some stuff. Some results that I didn't show included that as the season grew longer, the the neurocystis actually would have a significantly different. Um, uh, let's let's see if I I have actually a pocket slide here for this. Um, yeah, we're looking at uh, let's see this laser pointer. We're looking at the total blade biomass over here, so it's completely different. It decreases over time throughout the, um, the, the, the end of the cohort. So uh, the shading um, associated, or the shading uh, by the hosts, uh, by, that, um, uh, by those blades might be a little bit less substantial, like uh, conspecific neurocystis. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much, uh, do you have any other uh, questions regarding that? Or thank you. <laughs> yeah, she may chime back in in a sec. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to the next question, though, Dan, if you don't mind. And it's going to come in um, from uh, Bobby Dahlmeyer is going to unmute himself and ask you a question. Hi, Bobby. Dan. Uh, great presentation. Thank uh, you. I'm really impressed with all the work that you did. It's certainly nothing that I would do because it's too tiring. <laughs> I very much subscribe to a motto of maximum comfort, minimum effort. Um, it was so, the teamwork, really. Yeah. The teamwork. Um, so I have a couple questions here. Yes. Um, the first one I was looking when you presented the different sites, uh, it looks like you have Big Creek and then some other ones just in Carmel Bay. That being said, were there any site level differences that you observed in how this, you know, symbiotic relationship plays out between these two algae? Great question. Um, so I treated site as a random factor. Um, there, there were some, so I'm, I really wasn't interested too much in the specific um, among site differences. Uh, that being said, there were, a, there was a, a little bit, um, as I mentioned, um, relating to uh, the individual relationships. There were, there were a little bit difference, uh, of differences among uh, sites in relating, relating to uh, pyropia biomass. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife only allowed me to collect four individuals per site. And really I would need more, um, more replication to assess you know, whether or not there was a, um, the among site differences were, uh, were, if the relationship existed 
among those among site differences. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's too small because of permitting, right? Basically. Uh, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so then my next question, uh, just to keep us moving along here, uh, the gametophyte transplants, I thought that was actually a really cool experiment and really interestingly designed. Um, I really love seeing how the students are so creative with their methodology to make these things happen and answer these scientific questions. And so I was surprised that there was no observed difference in growth um, dependent on depth. And so I was wondering, uh, the pyropia that you collected and then transplanted, did they all come from the same depth or were there any differences uh, that they were taken from? Was it all from the same depth or were, you know, cause it maybe, I wasn't sure if maybe certain ones would be adapted to high, you know, more deep, uh, more deep places on the stipe or whether they were kind of randomly assigned and reassigned, randomly collected and reassigned. Now that is a great question. But you don't mention the most important part. The most important part was when did you collect those pyropia? So that those pyropia were actually collected later on in the year in March. So the, the, the amount of sunlight was a little bit more than what pyropia is usually accustomed to. Um, that might have facilitated a greater um, uh, growth at those deeper depths. Um, in, in regards to your question of where I collected them uh, along host types, they were all standardized. Um, uh, they were, one individual was collected per neurocystis, um, all in the upper meter of the water column. Okay, cool. So it went from shallow to all depths. Yes, yes. Okay. It yeah. went shallow. And, and I really, um, I wanted to, to do a, uh, a control, a transplant control where I put it back up at the surface but there was also um, safety concerns about putting a mooring out and getting it entangled and having the whole mooring be uh, removed or, or sunk or, or, or whatever, having a boat run it over and get it entangled. It no more, that all makes sense. Um, yeah. And so just my last question, uh, I've come to notice that Twitter has become a really big place for science communication. And so I was wondering if you could kind of encapsulate the biggest takeaway from your thesis in a tweet. Oh my God. Well, I don't use social media, so um, that's gonna be pretty hard. So it's like 120 characters. <sighs> well, I'd have to reread exact my conclusions, but um, essentially, uh, Yeah, I, I <laughs> let's go back here. Um, so the yeah, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I'm not. I, I if I if I write stuff, I take a, a pretty long time to, and uh, think about it a lot. Um, let's just say something like um, the. Actually, I, I can't. I can't answer that. I'm not going to answer that's that. That's okay. That's okay. You know, and you know what? When you're crafting tweets on Twitter, you have all the time in the world. So exactly. I just. Well, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to put words. Um, okay. You know. I hope you don't. I, I have. I have a worry that you're going to type whatever I say out, and it's. Gonna no, be I will. I will. <laughs> no, no, we're gonna. So we're gonna let it go with this. Dan's gonna have a piece go sour in a little while, and I will record the tweet and text it over to Bobby at that point because I think Dan will be slightly more comfortable when that's all <laughs> reflecting on what his thesis really means. I don't have any other hands up for questions. So I'm going to ask my question and then we are going to have a round of applause from everyone who wants to unmute and then motivate to the committee meeting so Dan can get moving forward. So Dan, you know, as your advisor, I obviously know what you've been doing, but I, I got to admit that, you know, it took me to see your talk and what you thought was most important in your thesis to raise a question that I think I actually really like. So I wanna see how you think about this. So you told us that, that Pyropia is more consistent than its host. I thought that was a really cool one-liner, which by the way, can make itself into a tweet at one point. And then coupled with the fact that you saw the Conchocelis actually increasing its growth rates and survivability with depth was really interesting because it makes you think, which is what you said during your talk, that it's probably everywhere down there in the bottom. So now I'm thinking to myself, Wait a minute. 
Pyropia is more consistent than the Nereo, and it's probably all over the bottom. If there's so much conchocelis down there pumping up conchospores regularly so that it's able to epiphytize when Nereo pops up, why don't those conchocelis go recruit on a whole bunch of other stuff? I mean, if it's everywhere, doesn't it seem weird that it would put out all those spores just for the possibility of getting on a Nereo if a Nereo pops up? Well, you're getting into uh, something I, I took out of my 40 minute introduction on my first practice talk. Um, so evolution and you know why is this obligate relationship um, there? Pyropia neurocystis, and you know we're really not we're really not sure that this from the genetic samples that I run that I ran um, or that were ran for me. Um, it's most likely that the species that I have looked at was Pyropia Um There's another, there's another epiphyte that is sympatric with Pyropia neurocystis, Pyropia theredii. It has a little bit different of a distribution, but it's a little bit longer. It goes all the way down into uh, the Gulf of California. Um, but epiphytism in Pyropia is not just for these two species. It's, it's all around. So it seems like the, the evolution of epiphytism really, um, it, it might have, it, it might have been a result of this. Um, it's not, it, there, there, maybe there was a mutation that occurred from one of these species. Maybe the distribution, it, uh, one of these conchocelis, um, conchospores, it, or maybe it was a little bit more widespread earlier. Um, there, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say um, why it's not more prevalent um, and why it's only on uh, Nereocystis, but maybe it's not as widespread. Maybe there, maybe there are only certain conditions, maybe it is widespread, but there are only certain conditions induced um, through some, you know, uh, functional uh, relationship that is hidden to us like the, for example, the snails. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't really, can't really say much more why. No, no, that's good. That's good. And that's where I said it. And I'm going to finish up with one more thing. Do you think that, you, you know, pyropia needs the Nereo, but do you think the Nereo needs the pyropia? No. So if that's the case, then I totally understand now after listening to you talk, why Nero would just be doing its thing but pyropia needs to have a safeguard. They need to have that highly persistent benthic stage in order to be able to have propagules ready whenever Nereo pops up. So I think it's finally starting to make a little bit more sense. And, and you know, I know you love to do this. You love to propose all these new things for people to do, but potentially looking at, at that aspect, which is the, the persistence of the conchocelis as the key to making these crazy epiphyte hosts dynamics like you know your committee member Dr. Stellar loves to talk about coilodesmi on Stephanocystis. It actually might be a more regular pattern, Dan. And so um, I think we're going to harass you about that in your committee meeting. And